So what I will do today is tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing over the last few years in my group um, at Imperial College and also through the satellite work at the Crick, which have been, has been incredibly enriching. Um, our focus is on hematopoietic stem cells. These are um, stem cells that are responsible for the maintenance of billions of uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets to be produced every day throughout our lifetime through the process of hematopoiesis, which is this very simple arrow here for this talk. Now, hematopoietic stem cells produce all these cells not only like clockwork, but also with an output that is uh, uh, adjusted on demand. And so their functionality is affected by multiple things that happen to us and multiple stresses. And what we like to understand with my group is how hematopoietic stem cell function changes during these stresses, and especially what are the cell extrinsic mechanisms that regulate this function. When I talk about cell extrinsic mechanism, I talk about mostly cells that reside within the bone marrow, which is a complex microenvironment, which we still poorly understand, despite having made a lot of progress over the last number of years. Um, and we're interested in it because this, the hematopoietic stem cells really only function when they're localized within the correct space within uh, the bone marrow tissue. What we know is that things uh, change dramatically for hematopoietic stem cells when stresses take place. One example is infection, and I will spend most of the talk today telling you about work that we've done in this field. And we know that when infection develops, it, especially when we have chronic and severe infections, they put hematopoiesis on overdrive, and especially hematopoietic stem cells need to produce much higher um, uh, amounts of progeny which uh, requires them to proliferate and leads them to often become exhausted. On the other hand, uh, the other main stress that we've been studying in the lab is what happens when leukemia takes, uh, develops and occupies, grows in the bone marrow and occupies bone marrow space and effectively um, shrinks healthy hematopoiesis and outcompetes it so that we have a dramatic loss of uh, production of healthy cells and eventually also of hematopoietic stem cells. Now, as I alluded to, all these processes take place within the bone marrow. And this is a tissue that is not only complex, but also traditionally has been relatively challenging to observe directly. Um, it is very important, however, that we look at it and that we, we really gain a good understanding of what cell types are there and where they are located and how do they interact, and especially how do they interact with hematopoietic stem cells. Because over the years, many different cell types, both stroma cell types, endothelial cells, and a number of hematopoietic differentiated cells have been shown one by one to be able to regulate hematopoietic stem cell function. And ideally, what I hope we'll see over the course of the next number of years is that we will understand understand how all these cells cooperate together, cooperate together to really fine tune um, hematopoietic stem cell function. So in order to do this, we have primarily been using intravital microscopy as our approach of choice because it allows us to take a peek directly inside uh, the bone of anesthetized mice and we can see the complexity of the bone marrow space and we can follow, we over, follow it over time for either a number of hours or sometimes even a number of days so that we can uh, see how processes develop. So I will start by telling you about some work that we started a few years ago looking at how leukemia affects the bone marrow microenvironment and hematopoietic stem cells. And this is work that was driven by Delphine Duarte, who was a very talented PhD student in the lab, and he's now running his own lab at Porto University. Um, he was interested in understanding how acute myeloid leukemia leads to loss of hematopoietic stem cells and remodels the bone marrow microenvironment. The model that he used is a very well established model of AML and it is based on the um, retroviral transduction of uh, granulocyte monocyte progenitors or other hematopoietic progenitors with uh, viruses encoding the oncogene MLLAF9. Uh, the, the construct carries GFP, but we tend to transduce tomato positive cells so that our leukemia cells are brightly uh, fluorescent in, uh, in the tomato channel. We inject the transduced cells into sublethally irradiated primary recipients, and here each mouse develops leukemia over the course of a number of weeks and ends up being fully infiltrated with a disease that is overall the same disease. However, when we performed RNA-seq transcriptomic analysis 
of blasts harvested from different uh, recipients, they, they were actually all a little bit different uh, because the, the disease develops with its own uh, course within each mouse. And so the model becomes a, a, a very good way of recapitulating some of the variability that we observe in, uh, in patients. The other great thing about this model is that we can then take cells from the primary recipients and inject them into non-irradiated secondary recipients. And so in this way, we have an excellent model that allows us to see what are the mechanisms that are used by fully malignant AML cells to occupy the whole of the Bomaro space and outcompete healthy hematopoiesis. So within this model, as you can see in the graph at the bottom, we can see um, uh, leukemia cells growing, and as they grow, healthy cells become fewer and fewer and are eventually almost entirely lost. Now, as I said, we've been using intravital microscopy to look at the interactions between healthy and malignant hematopoiesis. And the area that we tend to uh, analyze the most is the bone marrow that is contained in the calvarium of the mice. So in the scheme up here, you can see we, we uh, generally look on top of the skull of the mouse, the mice are anesthetized, put under the microscope, and we um, can generate tile scan images, such as the one that I'm showing you here uh, in the large image, when we can look at multiple cell types interacting. In particular here, we are seeing healthy hematopoietic cells in red, osteoblastic cells in cyan, and these were the first stroma cells as somehow associated to uh, the hematopoietic stem cell niche and, and known to have a link uh, with direct or indirect uh, with hematopoietic stem cell function. In yellow, we can see leukemia cells, and in blue, we can see vasculature, which we highlight by injecting sci-fi um, labeled dextran in the mice. Now, with this type of analysis, we learned a number of things. One of them is very obvious here, and it is that leukemia grows through foci. So it, 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 it is very localized initially, and the areas that contain leukemia then expand and become bigger and bigger, and little by little, the whole of the bone marrow cavity is, uh, is occupied. Um, not only this, but in the areas where leukemia is more uh, dense, these are also the areas where there is a more uh, dramatic remodeling of the microenvironment. And one of the things that we observed is that, for example, osteoblastic cells are lost. And we can see this really well if we focus on this area highlighted here, and we can look at it um, just in a, in a, a single uh, uh, 2D image in which we can also see the bone in cyan, you can really see that this, uh, the bone is in gray. We can see that the osteoblasts in cyan are present in patches along the endosteum, but as soon as we reach the front, developing front of leukemia, we no longer have the cyan patches of osteoblasts. Now what we learned is that the loss of osteoblasts in this model is a consequence of loss of endosteal transitional vessels. And it is also associated with the localized loss of hematopoietic stem cells and especially of hematopoietic stem cell niches. We could um, demonstrate the loss of HST niches because we could take mice that were either healthy or had been burdened with the uh, high infiltration of AML. We irradiated them and we transplanted them with fluorescently labeled healthy hematopoietic stem cells. And when we faxed their bone marrow two days later, we saw that the AML mice had a much lower capacity to uh, support the homing of healthy cells, which is a clear indication of loss of HST niches. Now, the, the nice side of this story was that we could think of ways of preserving the endosteum, and in particular, the endosteal vessels, and, uh, and these had beneficial effects on hematopoietic stem cells. So what you see here is our experimental setup. We treated, treated mice uh, that were developing AML with the ferroxamine. This is an iron chelator which also happens to activate uh, endothelial cells, especially for the transitional vessels. So in the images on the right, you can see uh, images from mice that are equally uh, heavily infiltrated with leukemia, but while the mouse at the top has, very, has been treated with PBS and has very little um, transitional vessels, the mouse at the bottom had been treated with the ferroxamine and, and it has much more evident um, endosteal vessels. And in these mice, if we look for hematopoietic stem cells, especially in the meta metaphysis of the long bones, where we have a high endosteal surface, we can see that in this case, we have a much higher number of uh, HSEs compared to uh, mice that were treated with PBS. So as a long, to make a long story short, 
What this work told us is that the Bomaro microenvironment is a very useful therapeutic tar target that we can think about when we want to preserve and support hematopoietic stem cells in the context of leukemia. And we are further pursuing uh, this line of work by looking at other potential targets within the microenvironment. For example, we are looking at uh, components of the extracellular matrix itself, and we are also looking at the um, more recently identified important component of the Bomaro microenvironment, which is the immune cells. Um, but for now, I'm going to switch gears and look at whether the Bomaro microenvironment remains uh, an appealing therapeutic target, not only in the context of leukemia, but also in the context of other stresses, such as infection. So I'm going to switch gear to another very talented PhD student, Miriam Haltali, who has now defended her PhD and is uh, working in Cambridge with Bertie Godgens. When she was here at Imperial, she uh, asked how a severe infection, such as severe malaria, affects hematopoietic stem cells and the bone marrow microenvironment. The model that she used is uh, very dear to us because it is a very um, natural uh, infection that develops in the mice and is based on uh, having the mice bitten by mosquitoes that carry the Plasmodium bergii that is the um, uh, agent that then uh, causes the development of uh, malaria in the infected mouse. The disease develops uh, exactly as malaria would in people. It goes through a liver stage, which in the mouse lasts for a couple of days, and then the parasites leave the liver and start uh, uh, multiplying in the blood, and we have the blood stage of disease. And actually, this is really a case of acute severe infection because it develops very quickly and it leads to death of the mice within about 10 to 12 days because of com complication due to um, clotting of blood vessels in the brain due to T cells making rosettes with the, with the parasites. So for us, what was useful to do was to follow the mice in, during the first week or so of infection so that we could really see what the acute effects would be. During these first seven days, we could follow um, uh, parasitemia grow within the mice. Um, we couldn't quite get to the stage where anemia develops, and anemia is one of the very typical um, traits of uh, human malaria. However, what we could see really well was the very uh, dramatic activation of the early hematopoietic uh, compartment. So when we compared fax plot from control and infected mice, uh, and we looked at populations that contain earlier progenitors, such as the LKS, which also contain HSEs, or more differentiated progenitors, such as what we call LK cells, you can see that already at a glance, the, the cell populations are very heavily affected in terms of numbers. So in order to understand better what was happening at the level of stem and progenitor cell populations in these models, we sorted this overall population and we performed single cell RNA-seq in collaboration with Bertie Godkins. And we did a number of analyses, and I'm only going to show you a couple here today. One was, this is one of the most dramatic effects we observed. And um, it was based on scoring each sequence cells uh, with what we call an HSC score, which is based on the expression of um, a number of genes that have been associated with stemness for the hematopoietic system. And you can see how in healthy mice, there is a significant proportion, a small but significant proportion of, of cells that score highly for the HSE score, but these are almost entirely lost uh, when we look at the infected mice. And now the very intriguing thing here is that even though the transcriptomics tell us that there's no stem cells anymore, when we look by fax using the usual five or six uh, typical markers, uh, uh, cell surface markers that we would use to identify the stem cells, that stem cell population doesn't seem to be affected at all. So what was important for us to do was to set up transplantation experiments in which we could test these phenotypic HSEs coming from healthy or infected mice and see whether they would be able to um, reconstitute irradiated recipients. And it was very clear that the HSEs harvested from the infected uh, mice had very, very poor uh, reconstitution ability. So that led to the obvious question of what are the mechanisms that lead to the damage of stem cells that we can see here, or to loss of HSC function. Now in the transplant, what we transplanted are these cells highlighted by the blue square here, which we normally call SLAM uh, HSPCs for stem and progenitor cells. 
And because we know that uh, infection causes the triggers the proliferation of stem cells, we use a method that we developed a couple of years ago that is based on injecting mice uh, in, in uh, quick succession with the EDU first and BRDU second, and that allows us to calculate the instantaneous proliferation rate of cells within a specific population so that we can then um, make very simple mathematical models that tell us, for example, what is the turnover of the population uh, over the course of the experiment um, and over the course of the measurements that we take. So we apply this method and we could in fact confirm that yes, proliferation does take place during this, uh, this model. And especially if we focus on the SLAM HSPC compartment, we can see that the compartment does turn over. So the black line is telling us about uh, turnover of the compartment in healthy mice. And you can see this is fairly slow and, and we don't have a full turnover of the compartment even during um, eight days. But in the case of the infected mice, the turnover does take place um, and, uh, and uh, it is quite dramatic. So just based on this um, uh, model, we could think that in fact, the extensive proliferation could be a cause for exhaustion of, uh, of the HSCs that we see in the transplants. However, the situation is a little bit more complicated than this. And again, a couple of years ago, we learned that if we focus on the true CD48 negative uh, population within the SLAM HSPCs, and these are the ones that we call CD48 negative HSCs, these cells are enriched for very highly functional hematopoietic stem cells with a very high capacity to reconstitute um, literally irradiated recipients. So we had a look at what would be the proliferation within this compartment and what would be the turnover. Proliferation was there, definitely. However, the turnover of the population wasn't quite as dramatic as that that we were observing for the SLAM um, HSPC population. And so this made us think that proliferation alone probably was not the only cause of damage to the HSCs that we were seeing. Together with this, the other thing we noticed is that once we started focusing on the CD48 negative HSEs, actually their number was slightly reduced. So we were not losing SLAM HSPC overall, but the CD48 negative HSEs uh, seem to be particularly susceptible to the infection. And this actually for us is particularly interesting because this very same population is actually particularly refractory to being damaged by leukemia. So these are the very last cells that we lose as leukemia takes place in the bone marrow. So this is, taking us that there are, is telling us that there are some very different um, processes taking place in the bone marrow when we have leukemia stress versus when we have infection stress. Anyway, once we saw all this, we thought it's definitely worth asking what it is that is mediating the, the damage and loss of function of HSEs that we see, and could the bone marrow microenvironment play a role in this? So how to tackle this? We started off by going back to the RNA-seq analysis, and we asked what are the genes that are, main, that are differentially expressed and that are most responsible for the stark difference between healthy hematopoietic stem cells, stem and progenitor cells, and those from uh, Pibergia infected mice. As we can see in this spring plot, the two populations really sit completely far apart, but we can ask what are the genes responsible for the distance between the two populations, and we could come out with short lists or with long lists of genes, but essentially what we would always come up with were lots and lots of genes that were involved in interferon uh, responses. So we measured the levels of interferon gamma um, in the infected mice, both in the serum and in the bone marrow supernatant, and we could see that in fact in both places interferon gamma was elevated. We already knew that interferon gamma would be high in the serum, uh, but it was interesting to see it high also within the bone marrow. Now there are other inflammatory cytokines that are known to be um, elevated in, the, in this uh, model of infection, and we could see um, indications that their, their, their signaling was active in these mice through the RNA-seq, and these were interferon alpha and TNF-alpha. However, while we could see them and they, they, they were definitely um, dramatically increased, their increase was still not quite as high as what we were seeing with interferon gamma. And so we decided to tackle interferon gamma first, basically. So we... It, it is known that in a number of models of infection, if we infect interferon gamma receptor null mice, the HSCs don't respond and, uh, and they don't proliferate in, respond to, in response to infection. And this is the case also for the Plasmodium bergia infection. 
So what we decided to ask was whether interferon gamma receptor knockout HSC would be fundamentally in, are in, unresponsive to the infection, or whether these would still be somehow mediated by their environment. And so we generated chimeras in which, we, in which we could follow interferon gamma receptor knockout HSEs that were surrounded by interferon gamma receptor wild type stroma or deficient stroma. And these chimeras were a little bit more complex than simply uh, uh, achieved by transplanted interferon gamma receptor knockout bone marrow into wild type or knockout recipients because we also injected equal amounts of um, wild type bone marrow so that we would have interferon gamma receptor proficient um, immune cells and we would still have immune responses taking place. So once we generated these mixed chimeras, we waited uh, a number of weeks to reach full chimerism, then we infected them, and then we looked at the interferon gamma receptor knockout HSEs. And the interesting thing that we could see was that the knockout HSEs would still respond to infection by proliferating as long as they were in a wild type um, recipient. And this proliferation was no longer taking place if the immune response was taking place. However, the stroma was interferon gamma receptor knockout. So this experiment told us that it would be useful uh, to look at the stroma of the mice. So we started off by looking at our old friends osteoblasts. And what you're seeing here are tile, are tile scans in which we're looking at the mice from the top. The uh, nose of the mouse would be up towards the top of the, of the slide and the ears would be down towards the bottom. And we're seeing osteoblastic cells in green. In control mice, you can see again the usual patches even redistributed throughout the bone marrow. We can see vasculature in blue, but you can see that as infection develops, we are slowly but surely uh, decreasing the density of osteoblast until we get to day seven where we have practically lost um, all of the osteoblasts. And again, this was double interesting for us to see because it is something that happens during, during infection, but actually we see loss of osteoblasts also in mice that develop leukemia. However, the dynamics of loss of osteoblasts are completely different in the two models, and they are very uh, localized in, uh, in the leukemia models while they're completely systemic, and we have a progressive thinning of the overall osteoblast population in the case of uh, severe infection. Now, um, osteoblasts have been associated with uh, uh, healthy quiescent hematopoietic stem cells for a long time. Um, and in fact, there are some very well, relatively old experiments uh, which show that if mice are treated with parathyroid hormone, which is uh, anabolic for uh, osteoblast and leads to bone formation as long as it's uh, administered intermittently for a couple of weeks, mice that are treated with PTH have more bone and more functional hematopoietic stem cells. So we thought, let's try and treat mice with PTH, starting prior to the infection and then up to the usual day seven of analysis. What we saw was that in this case, we could rescue a significant amount of osteoblasts. The mice didn't quite look healthy, uh, but they definitely looked better than the PBS treated mice that had pretty much lost all of the osteoblasts. And the very interesting thing that we could see here is that we were able to uh, completely abrogate the proliferation of uh, um, uh, the Islam HSBC population. Now, the interesting thing here was that even though we were avoiding the proliferation of the, of the HSEs, their ability to reconstitute uh, irradiated mice was still uh, pretty much non-existent. And so again, this was in a way a confirmation that proliferation is not really the, 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 the real problem uh, in, in this issue, in this, in this situation. The other thing that we could see is that within the um, SLAM HSPC population, the number of CD48 negative HSEs was still diminished, even though um, the mice had more osteoblasts and they had uh, less proliferation happening in the stem cell compartment. The other stroma compartment that we looked at was endothelial cells. And in these time-lapse movies, you see endothelial cells in black from flick one gfp uh, endothelial reporter mice. And you see a healthy mouse on the left and an infected mouse of day seven on the right. And I'm going to try and play these movies again. Uh, and what you can see is on the left, not much happens. But on the right, the blue arrow point at endothelial cells that sort of wriggle a little bit and you can see that the mass of their body is, is shifting from one position to the other and the red arrows 
are pointing at uh, GFP positive cells that leave the endothelium altogether and start migrating within the parenchyma. And while we still really don't understand the biology of this phenomena, what we thought is that prob what this probably would correlate with would be increased leakiness of the vasculature, which we checked again by intravaltal microscopy by injecting um, low molecular weight uh, dextran and observing that while this does not extravasate in a healthy mouse, it does extravasate in the parenchyma very rapidly in infected mice, and we could calculate this. Now, in healthy mice at steady state, it has been shown that HSCs that reside next to more um, leaky vessels, more, more permeable vessels, uh, tend to be more proliferative and slightly less functional. So we decided to check whether in this case, uh, in the infected mice, um, this would be the case for uh, uh, the hematopoietic stem cells as well. And the thing that we could measure here was reactive oxygen species, which has been shown to be higher in healthy HSEs in healthy mice that are close to more uh, leaky vessels. And so as we would expect at this point, we could see higher level of reactive oxygen species in HSEs. And interestingly, we could go back to our PTH treated mice. And also in this case, we could see elevate high levels of reactive oxygen species um, in the HSEs. So what we started thinking at this point was perhaps what could be useful would be to quench the reactive oxygen species, which we could do by treating mice with NAC and acetylcysteine starting two days prior to infection and up to day seven. Here we could see that, in fact, we could reduce the uh, levels of reactive oxygen, the number of reactive oxygen species, HSEs, in the infected mice. However, we still had high proliferation of HSEs, and we still had loss of uh, CD48 negative HSEs. So this by itself didn't look very good, and we didn't think that NAC alone would actually rescue the function of HSEs. So what we decided to try instead was to treat mice with both PTH and NAC and see if the two combined could have an effect. And in this case, in the double treated mice, we could see uh, a reduction, actually a total rescue of the amount of HSCs that would be cell rocks positive. Um, we could also have a significant reduction of the proliferation of HSCs, not a complete uh, abolishment of the proliferation, but at least way less proliferation than in the case of um, uh, PBS treated mice, and we were not losing the CD48 negative HSCs. And in this case, when we transplanted our HSPC, SLAM HSPC population, we could see the green line here. We did not have, oh, where did it go? We did not have as good reconstitution as from uh, healthy mice but we had significantly better reconstitution than from the infected, untreated mice. So this for us is, is quite exciting because it, it, is, it is promising. It says that there are things that we can do to start and improving the function of HSEs despite um, the severe infection. So at the moment, what we think is happening here is that we, with the Pibergia infection, we have high levels of interferon gamma. There is no doubt that interferon gamma has a direct effect on HSEs because they have the receptor, but it is also becoming clear that it has a widespread effect on multiple components of the niche, and these can be useful targets um, if we want to prevent, uh, uh, preserve HSC function uh, during severe infections. So I will stop here for now, but I need to thank everybody that has been working in the group, not only contributing to these two stories that I presented to you, but also to all the other ones that have been uh, developing over the last number of years, and especially over the last uh, few months that have been incredibly challenging, uh, but actually productive uh, nonetheless. And I, at, the, at, at the moment, I particularly like looking at our pictures as a group before we had to be all socially distanced. Uh, and lastly, I will just very briefly mention our funders that, of course, are the ones that make everything possible. Um, and we have a, a, a large cohort of fantastic collaborators, somebody nearby and somebody further away. A number of them are helping us with the leukemia work and a number of them are helping us with the infection work. And overall, it's a fantastic network to be part of. So I will stop here and take questions if there's any.